many of you might know, I have returned from uh, a trip from, uh, from Palestine. And I went to Masjid Al-Aqsa. And I want to share with you some of the most amazing stories that I have come across in my life when it comes to converts. And we all, as Muslims born into Islam, one of the reasons we love when people convert, one of the reasons it's so exciting, we all become happy, is because it reaffirms our own faith in our tradition. It makes us feel, alhamdulillah, that something we might not have appreciated, but this person has appreciated. And we feel, and we should rightfully feel, we feel a sense of pride that alhamdulillah, somebody has found what we have taken for granted. And there's no problem in, 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 in being that happy and whatnot, but you should be happier at your own Islam, by the way, right? You should be even happier that Allah has guided you to Islam. And there's, it's good to reaffirm our faith through uh, the stories of converts. And that's why our convert brothers and sisters, they know every time they're in a Muslim gathering, the first question after they find out they're Muslim, oh, how did you convert? That conversion story, it is really powerful for us born Muslims. We love to hear it because it reaffirms our faith. It makes us feel so good. It makes us feel a sense of pride and I want to share with you stories that I myself have interviewed and witnessed because for me and Allah Azza wa has blessed me to see many and interact with many converts but this group for me was the most bizarre and the most uh, moving for me and this is one of the reasons why this question even though I've been thinking about it for a long time it really became very powerful in my mind for the last few weeks I'm going to only tell you three stories I met a group of, of converts all of these converts are Israeli Jewish converts to Islam all of them and it was truly the most strange stories of converts that I have ever met. The first of them, I'm going to quickly summarize the three stories because each of them is very powerful that it really moved me. The first of them, I actually got an email many months ago, last year. Uh, and I unfortunately don't have time to answer to all of my email, but sometimes Allah just blesses and I'm able to. An email came uh, to my public account and uh, it was a lady from uh, Israel and she literally starts off that I was born into a Jewish family uh, I'm from uh, a Western country. I cannot give too many details by the way, we'll understand why and uh, I migrated to Israel for religious reasons It's called the Aliyah uh, Hijrah. I made Hijrah to Israel as a young girl. I abandoned the West the, She is in the uh, this part of the world. I abandoned and I moved there and over the last few years I grew agnostic now I'm looking for the truth and I've read the Quran and I'm you know, and I came across your lectures online and uh, I'm interested, etc., etc. So obviously, this is a very interesting, of course, it's a bit strange as well. I mean, uh, very rare to find that type of person. So we began a series of emails and whatnot. Then I said, you know what? It was, I then emailed her in like late November. So, you know, I'm coming in January. Why don't we meet up in Aqsa? We meet up. She had never been to Aqsa because she's not allowed to go because she's uh, obviously from another background. She had never been to Masjid al-Aqsa. So uh, we agreed to meet up and subhanAllah to make a long story short, uh, she was not exposed to Islam via da'wah tables, via pamphlets. That doesn't happen in that land. It does not happen. Rather, she felt a sense of emptiness and she did not find that peace in her own faith of her tradition. She didn't find it in Christianity. She looked at Buddhism, other uh, religions, and in the end, out of desperation, she picked up a Quran. She didn't think she'd find anything in it. And she said, this is the book I have been taught is full of hatred. This is what she told me. My whole life I have been taught this book teaches to kill other people, hatred of other people. And she goes, I read it and read it and read it and I found nothing but peace. I found nothing but peace. And so she went online looking for lectures. She found my lectures, listened to some of them. And subhanAllah, my lecture about Khadija was the one that really moved her a lot about Khadija alayhi salam. She said, I want it to be like Khadija. I want it to be like Khadija. And subhanAllah, brothers and sisters, she gave her shahada in Masjid al-Aqsa with our group and gathering there. I gave her the shahada. She said the kalima and she accepted Islam in Masjid al-Aqsa. And we were not able to record because she said she cannot be public about this. She cannot tell other people or else it's going to cause issues for her and her family. That obviously she has to keep it under the, 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 the you know, keep it uh, under the cover. And I gave her Islamic name of Aisha. Uh, so we call her now Aisha and our sisters that were in the group are in touch with her. And subhanAllah, she's now active online da'wah, believe it or not, but anonymously. She's giving da'wah anonymously online. Now, when I was in Aqsa, I met a brother there who knew me from online and he said, look, I need to introduce you to a group, but you cannot take any pictures. You have to be on the low. Don't come with anybody, just yourself in Masjid Al-Aqsa. And I said, who are these? They said, he said, 
we are giving da'wah to some of the Yehud, but we're doing it not publicly. Because if you do it publicly, there's going to be a huge trouble. So I said, there are actually converts here in this land? And he told me this, brother, we estimate at least 1,000 people have converted. We know around three, 400. And from those three, 400, we know that there are others. The majority of them are not saying anything to anybody. They come and learn what they need to and then go back to their daily lives. A few of them, a few of them are public and a few of them have had to flee from their families and homes and come and find shelter in uh, Muslim lands. And they have heard about you. They want to meet you and, and, and they would want to sit with you. I said, of course, my pleasure, my honor to meet with them. So uh, after Salat al-Fajr, we prayed at Masjid al-Aqsa. We went to one of the offices uh, inside the, the, the complex and we met like five or six of Israeli Jews who had converted to Islam, none of them had converted by one-on-one -on -one da'wah. None of them. Because that doesn't really happen. You know, in America, we have this, this freedom. You go in a booth and you give da'wah, you give pamphlets, you know, you, you knock on your neighbor's house, whatnot. There, as you know, there's a lot of, of religious segregation. There's no public preaching per se, even though theoretically it's legal, but you know what's going to happen if they actually do this, right? So each one of them, they had been guided to Islam on their own. Like just research and internet and, and, and buying pamphlets or, or doing this and that. And then they're contacting, you know, Muslim families until finally there's this, a small group of brothers that they're giving da'wah in Hebrew. In Hebrew. And so eventually they're all connected to, to this group. And I just want to mention two more stories that really moved me. One of them uh, was a sister. Uh, she's now 19 years old. When she was 16, when she was 16, she wrote an email to this group of brothers who have a page on Facebook, which is in Hebrew, Da'wah to Islam. She was 16 years old, and she says, I have decided to convert to Islam. And the group emailed back, look, we can't do anything. We cannot do anything. You are a minor, and we cannot get into any trouble. Best of luck and goodbye. She kept on emailing fiqhi questions, aqidah questions, and they have to answer just simple questions, right? She began to pray in her own house, in her closet, at the age of 16. And she began to get material online from them. And I was with the brother who uh, eventually, had the, there was a family, an elderly man and woman, they're living in, outside of, of, of Jerusalem. And they found, or the, the group that is the da'wah group, they found a family that at great risk to them, would be willing to take in this, this young girl. This young girl, the night she turned 18, because they said we can't do anything legally, we don't want any trouble. The night she turned 18, she packed her bags, went to a phone booth, called the brother and said, I'm standing here, you told me when I'm 18 it would be legal, I'm 18, come pick me up. I cannot be with my family anymore. The brother became very worried, what is this, a trap, what not? Because obviously it's very dangerous, right? And he went with a group of family, sisters, whatnot. They found out everything seems legit, whatnot. She says, I need a place. I cannot be at home. I'm not allowed to pray. They're forcing me to do this and that. I need to get out to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They made a few phone calls. A family agreed with great risk to them to take this young lady in. And she's now learning Arabic, memorizing Quran. Now listen, in that country when you're 18, do you know what you have to do? You have to go to the military and army. Okay? And her papers came. And the family said, look, we're not going to do anything. This is between you and the government. Because again, they understand you cannot risk your life, right? So you know what they did? She said, fine, give me my paperwork and I'm going to go. Wearing my hijab and telling them I'm a Muslim. She went to the IDF. She went to the, the military. And she and the brother told me, the brother was saying, Ya khi wallahi ana tarak, she, in Arabic, he said, I, I swear I left her a mile outside. I didn't want to go close to the post. I just dropped her. I said, call me when you're done. Because they're scared for their own lives, right? So the elderly couple, they left him out, her outside. She walked to the post wearing hijab. She handed the papers of the, you know, conscription. And she goes, by the way, I'm a Muslim. So you should know that before you do anything else. And for three months, her case went back and forth. What should they do? Until finally they gave her a letter that for reasons, for whatever, we don't need you to work in the army. But the courage she must have had to walk in and to be who she is. And now she's memorizing the Quran, learning Arabic. Her Arabic was better than her English when she's talking to me. And subhanAllah, just mind-boggling for me to meet somebody like this. 
And the third story, and time is short, but this third story, wallahi, it was very emotional for me. And I had to really control my tears because it was very, very difficult for me to maintain composure. There was one of the people there, there was some brothers and, and four or five sisters, as usual, there are more sisters who convert, even in that society. And there was one sister who was very quiet, she didn't say a single word, not a single word, while we were there other than salam. And we were going around the table, what is your story, what is your story, tell me your story. And when it came to her, she couldn't speak English. She's like third generation now, you know, living in that land. She speaks fluent Hebrew, uh, but she doesn't speak English. So it was being translated in Hebrew to me by the middle man, the, the brother there. And her story was so traumatic for me that it really, it shook me. And I almost had to just break down. I had to literally compose myself. This lady in her 30s, she was the wife of a rabbi. And she decided to convert to Islam after reading it on her own, studying it and whatnot. Her husband, when he found out, of course, divorced her, threatened her, and then took them to court that my wife is mentally insane and she has to be deprived of her children. She had three children. And the brother, the middleman told me, and this literally caused me almost to break down. She sa he said that this mother has not seen her children for three years. For three years, she has not seen her children because the husband has said that she's dangerous to the kids because now she has embraced Islam. For three years. And she said to me, this lady, that wallahi, I swear if they threw me in jail, I will not give up Islam. If they threw me into a cave and abandoned me, I would not give up Islam. And I almost broke down that this was a lady, she, she voluntarily gave up her three children. She did not lie for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She did not say an untruth. She just said, I'm a Muslim. And because of that, they took her children away from her. And it really made me feel so... Here we are, we cannot even give up our sins, brothers and sisters. You know, we cannot give up anything for Islam. But here is a lady, and she did not even grow up in a Muslim household. And she told me, if they throw me in jail, or they throw me into a cave and abandon me, I will not give up Islam. And you know, you hear these stories from Bilal ibn Rabah, from Sufun, and I'm not comparing astaghfirullah this to that, but you know, we've kind of sort of lost that level of Iman in our Muslim societies. When's the last time you met somebody with that level of Iman? We've kind of lost that persecution Iman. But to meet these people in the very land that we know is the land of Mahshar and the land of Ard al-Mubarak, to meet the people, and they said to me, their families don't just view them as converts, their families view them as traitors. They have left the society and they have nowhere to go. They're being taken care of by poor Muslims here and there, and they're giving up their society, their luxury, their life, and in this case, their children for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If that is not going to cause us to appreciate the blessings of Islam, then what will? Brothers and sisters, let us always remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gifted us this faith without us having to lift a finger. The majority of us were born into it. And even those who converted, yes, your struggles are more than ours, ours. But look at the struggles of the, those brothers and sisters in that land.